On the 16th of June 1922, voters in the Longford Westmead constituency, and indeed across the 26 counties of what was then termed Southern Ireland, went to the polls to decide the composition of the nascent Irish Free State's Parliament and ultimately its government. This was a fraught time in modern Irish history when two different conceptions of Irish freedom were at play, crystallising in two rival polities. On the one hand, supporters of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, who backed the establishment of a 26 county state bolstered by the National Army and administered for the time being by a provisional government, and on the other, opponents of the treaty, faithful to the All-Ireland Republic established as they saw it in 1916. The 1922 election was preceded by a tense period in which these rival factions jockeyed for position. With British military and police forces having left Ireland or demobilised under the terms of the treaty, confrontations between the two sides often focused on how and by whom vacated barracks across the country were occupied. Events in Mullingar from mid to late April 1922, for example, demonstrate how these confrontations frequently spilled over into violence. A significant escalation occurred on the 14th of April when anti-treaty forces occupied the four forts in Dublin and established it as a headquarters for what was termed the Irish Republican Army Executive. Amid the looming prospect of internecine warfare, both sides recognised the merits of letting the Irish public have its say, and so an election was called by the Dáil on the 19th of May. The difference between this and the elections of 1918 and 1921 would be that the system of proportional representation by single transferable vote came into operation. Also, the field would be open to candidates from other parties, including Labour and various sectional interests. Thus, there was a possibility that Sinn Féin, now itself divided over the treaty, would see the power it had gained in Ireland since 1918 substantially eroded. There was also a real chance that if the election was contested specifically on the subject of the treaty, the campaign would deteriorate into bitterness and violence. For that reason, Michael Collins and Eamon de Valera, the respective leaders of the pro and anti-treaty factions of Sinn Féin, agreed on a pact to take the sting out of simmering hostilities and to allow the election to be fought on more mundane issues. The pact between Collins and de Valera provided for a unified Sinn Féin panel which, in theory, would disregard differences over the treaty, while Labour, the farming and business communities and other interests could also run candidates. In Longford Westmead, despite the pretense of unity, separate conventions were held by the pro and anti-treaty factions of Sinn Féin. The latter chose Lawrence Ginnell, the ageing former MP and pioneer of political cattle driving, as their candidate. Ginnell had recently returned from Argentina, where despite pressure from home, he had articulated a strong anti-treaty position. Representing the pro-treaty camp on the panel were National Army General Sean McKeown, leader of the IRA's storied North Longford Flying Column, the agrarian radical Lorcan Robbins of Tullinagira Moat, and Ginnell's former cellmate in Reading Jail, Frank McGuinness, brother of the former Longford TD and 1916 prisoner Joseph McGuinness, who died weeks before the election. Meanwhile, Labour put forward Sean Lyons, a chairmaker and union activist from Moat, while the Ratepayers Association backed independent candidate and Longford native Patrick Belton, a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood who had lived in London for years. The prelude to the election was not as acrimonious in Longford Westmead as it was in some other constituencies, and the terms of the pact were largely observed. If anything, the anti-treaty candidate Lawrence Ginnell had to worry more about a lack of commitment among his own supporters. His wife Alice, who worked as his election agent, observed that on polling day none of the anti-treaty election workers seemed very much in earnest, and that one organiser was spotted following Sean McKeown's car all over the place. At the campaign's outset, Ginnell, who had suffered ill health during his final months in Argentina, was residing in a convalescent home in Wicklow. He was urged by his wife to return to Westmead and to attend rallies in Ballymahan, Athlone, Mullingar and Castle Pollard. In Athlone and Mullingar, the content of speeches from the various candidates suggested that the workings of the pact were, overtly at least, being observed. In Mullingar, Patrick Brett, one of Ginnell's oldest lieutenants who nevertheless broke with him on the question of the treaty, chaired the meeting and extolled the virtues of Ginnell, Robbins and McKeown with equal gusto. The panel rally in Athlone was also good-tempered. 
Ginnell underlined Republican unity as the central plank of his campaign and vowed that if fight be necessary, he would fight the common enemy, but he would not fight his own countrymen. However, McKeown was more subtle in his rhetoric. Like the anti-treatyites, he was critical of the decision taken by Labour and other sectional interests to run non-panel candidates. All of Irish society's interests were catered for by the panel, McKeown told the Athlone audience, carefully crediting his pro-treaty running mate Lorcan Robbins as the candidate representing rural and farming interests, while pigeonholing Ganell as the voice of the professional body. In a letter to her family, Alice Ganell described McKeown's address as one of the cleverest election speeches she had ever heard, and with good reason. In criticising the sectional candidates, in particular Patrick Belton, McKeown was masking what all Ganellites suspected, that Belton, a close friend of Michael Collins, had been put forward by Collins as an independent to steer undecided voters away from Ganell. Also, McKeown's categorisation of Ganell as being representative of the professional body was hardly accurate. Ganell had fought long and hard for the interests of rural communities and small farmers in Westminster, and had always been at loggerheads with the professional classes in Mullingar. Knowing full well the lingering agrarian tendency in Westmead, McKeown's rhetoric was a subtle play to garner more votes for Robbins. While the panel of Sinn Féin candidates ostensibly soldiered on publicly and maintained a semblance of unity, Alice Ganell believed that behind the scenes, the pact had all but collapsed. Everything that could go wrong went wrong was her assessment despite being allocated two Republican organisers and the public backing of Count George and Countess Plunkett. As polling day approached, she heard rumours that pro-treaty canvassers had been instructed to seek votes not for the entire Sinn Féin panel, but specifically for McKeown, McGuinness and Robbins. In its June 10th edition, meanwhile, the Westmead Independent in Athlone published an advertisement which presented itself as a guide to the voting process, but finished by exhorting readers to vote for the four candidates who will support the treaty. Alice Ginnell also claimed that intimidation went hand in hand with these petty slights. On the 13th of June, three days before the poll, she claimed to have narrowly avoided being shot after being stopped at gunpoint by provisional government troops in Mullingar while returning from a canvas. The OC at Mullingar military barracks, Captain Pather Conlon, insisted that the incident was a misunderstanding what Alice and her fellow canvassers deemed otherwise. The Ganell's suspicions about the pact were confirmed the following day when at a rally in Cork City, Michael Collins appeared to repudiate the pact by urging the public to, quote, vote for the candidates you think best of. On the night of June 15th, the eve of the election, the text of the draft constitution of the Irish Free State was published. In the eyes of anti-treatyites, this served not only to throw voters but also to make any numerical majority secured by the pro-treaty camp appear as though the public had voted definitively in favour of the treaty. As it transpired, the story of the election in Longford Westmead was the success of Sean Lyons, the Labour candidate, who won a seat with 7,073 first preference votes. Sean McKeown topped the poll with 10,152, while Ganell was a safe third with 5,022. Frank McGuinness, with 2,280, took the final seat on transfers. Under the new system of proportional representation, both McKeown and Lyons were elected on the first count, with Ganell passing the quota on the third count on the back of transfers from Lyons. With anti-treaty Sinn Féin's first preference vote amounting to just 17.4%, as opposed to the treaty eight Sinn Féin vote of over 50%, the result could be read as an overwhelming rejection of Ganell and his fellow dissenters. However, as historian Marie Coleman argues, these figures come with a health warning, with the absence of comprehensive data on voter motivations ensuring that it was difficult to say what exactly people believed their vote would achieve. One possible factor influencing the outcome was old-fashioned parochialism. In terms of domicile, the six candidates were divided evenly between Longford and Westmead, as were their votes. The three Longford candidates received a combined first preference vote of 14,690, while their Westmead counterparts garnered 14,091. Given the extent to which McKeown transferred to his fellow county man, Frank McGuinness, the Longford vote clearly stayed local. Whether the same was true of Westmead is debatable. 
In terms of the size of its electorate, Westmead was the bigger of the two counties. In 1918, its voters had outstripped those of Longford by over 3,500. But despite this fact, three and a half years later, Longford candidates still picked up the larger combined first preference vote. This swing towards Longford could be explained by the appeal of a personality like Sean McKeown. While Ganell was in the Americas, McKeown had played a leading role in the guerrilla war and recently had the honour of overseeing the showpiece handover of Athlone military barracks by the departing Crown forces. His dramatic March 1921 arrest in Mullingar, coupled with his subsequent escape from the noose, must have resonated locally. All of these combined factors could have convinced some Westmead voters that McKeown had sufficient local credentials, as well as vigour, prestige and orthodoxy on the national question, to earn their first preference vote. While it is unlikely that McGuinness picked up many votes in Westmead, given that McKeown was more visible at meetings in Athlone and Mullingar, the performance of Labour and Sean Lyons was surely key to the fall in Lawrence Gunnell's first preference vote. Labour itself was divided over the treaty, but the party leadership was in favour of it, and Lyons took the lead from them. For that reason, it could be the case that the success of a Labour candidate from Westmead indicated that voters wanted to maintain their radical demands for land and social justice, while backing away from a repudiation of the treaty, which might bring further war and jeopardise their future prosperity. Notably, in counties like Offaly and Galway, where agrarian trouble had been rife for years, Labour candidates were returned. Meanwhile, political historian Michael Gallagher has suggested that Labour's vote nationally was driven in some part by traditional Irish party supporters and others who were prepared to vote for almost any candidate rather than support Sinn Féin. Indeed, Westmead Examiner proprietor John P. Hayden, himself a crusading anti Sinn Féiner in 1918, certainly appeared intrigued by Labour's turn in the limelight, writing that the party's programme required further examination. But while Gallagher argues that it would be naive to think that Labour's support was driven purely by the party's social and economic programme, the nature of the campaign run by Lyons in a county that was once a hotbed for cattle driving cannot be ignored. Earlier in January 1922, at a meeting of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union in Moat, chaired by Lyons, Delegates agreed that the problem of unemployment in South West Mead would never be solved until the workers petitioned on Dáil with a view to compelling the farmers to till at least 15% of their land and get the big ranches broken up and divided among the people. Although a pro-treaty atmosphere prevailed at the meeting, Lyons expressed his hope that the proposed Irish Free State will not be a state for capitalists alone, but also for those who fought and won. To achieve these goals, in the eyes of Lyons and the pragmatists in the Labour leadership such as Thomas Johnson and William O'Brien, peace and stability of government offered under the treaty were absolutely necessary. But for Ginnell and his fellow anti-treatyites, the proposed state was not only a betrayal of the Republic, but also a hindrance to the radical democratic programme of the First Dáil. It was the drawing of these red lines, perhaps, and the fear of a return to war with Britain which compelled over 7,000 voters in Longford Westmead to opt for Lyons as they went to the polls 100 years ago.